We're reading our scripture this morning from Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 13 from the New International Version. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that, through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. I ask you therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Get up, Homer, it's time for church. Wanna go? It's church. You have to go. Too cold out. I'm tired of having this argument every Sunday. Get dressed. Oh, stupid itchy church pants. One size fits all my butt. Come on, we're going to be late. Forget it. I'm not going. I'm afraid our furnace isn't working. Yeah, what's the story? But uh, let's just put it out of our minds and turn to the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Long version. You must be the three chiropractors I sent for. Now start manipulating my spine. Hey, Mo, we don't know nothing about manipulating. You heard the lady. Grab a spine and get cracking. <laughs> Mo is their leader. Why you? Ah, my beloved family. Oh, it's church. I, on the other hand, have been having the best day of my life, and I owe it all to skipping church. That's a terrible thing to say, kids. Your father doesn't really mean that. Like fun I don't, Marge. I'm never going to church again. Homer, are you actually giving up your faith? No, 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 no. Well, yes. I imagine that some of us can empathize with Homer. We didn't know there were going to be balloons there, and thankfully our heat is working, although we're right in that weird time where we might need heat, we might need air conditioning, but a lot of us can empathize. Now, we feel that pressure every Sunday morning. Maybe it's a fight in your household between one spouse and the other, or between parents and kids. Do we really have to do this? Do we have to put on those uncomfortable clothes and make that drive and show up and sit in those uncomfortable pews and look at those people, most of whom I like, but every now and then they get to be a bit much. Do we really have to do this? But you all are here, so you've decided on that side of the coin, and others of you are joining at home, but all of us can empathize at least a little bit with how Homer feels. And maybe that empathy increased during this time of pandemic, when we realized that we can participate in church service from home and we don't have to worry about uncomfortable clothes or annoying people or uncomfortable seating. But there's probably one area, one area where almost all of us would vehemently disagree with not just Homer, but Homer and Marge together. Because did you catch what Marge said at the very end there? Homer says, I'm never going back to church ever again. And Marge's response is not, you're giving up on church, but her response is, are you really giving up on your religion? We might say our faith. And most of us, Homer, of course, denies profusely, no, 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 I'm not giving up on my faith. And he goes, well, yeah, actually I am, yes. And most of us would dispute this idea. 
that to not go to church is to deny our faith or to give up on our faith in some way, shape, or form. Most of us would dispute that. Even very, very devout people would dispute that. We have slogans about how separate church participation is from a life of faith. We say things like, the church is not a building, it's a people. Or we say, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger or sitting in a garage makes you an automobile. We have divorced in contemporary culture, divorced the idea of participating in a gathered community of faith from being a person who follows Jesus, a person of faith or a religious person. We've separated these two. And we've done that for some good reasons, to emphasize that what really matters about church is not that you show up and do some religious duty, but you have a sense of inner conversion within yourself, that your heart be strangely warmed by the presence of Christ, personally, individually. Although it's been fascinating when the pandemic hit and many churches discovered that it was unsafe for them to meet together, how quickly people started singing a different tune. How can we be the people of God if we aren't allowed in our buildings to worship together? Some of the same people who a couple weeks earlier would have been saying, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. What matters is your own personal experience. Now we're saying, well, wait, if we can't gather together in person, can we really practice our faith? But most of us would disagree with Homer and Marge's assessment that what counts about our faith or what counts about our religious practice is participation in the gathered community. We would say it's entirely possible to go weeks, months, years on end, never setting foot in a church, but still consider yourself to be a spiritual person, maybe even a religious person, maybe even a follower of Jesus. But what I want to suggest is that Scripture actually teaches us something a little bit different and a little bit more challenging. I'm not sure if you heard it when Milt was reading it, but I want to draw your attention to one specific claim that the author of Ephesians, maybe it was Paul, maybe it was someone else, the author of Ephesians makes saying this, Through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God's self-revelation of God's own wisdom being revealed not just to earthly creation or humanity, but being revealed to principalities and powers, those spiritual forces that oppose or resist God. God's self-revelation showing this is who I am and this is what my wisdom is. That self-revelation comes through the church. Not an individual conversion experience, not one single solitary person who feels their heart strangely warmed, and commits to follow Christ, as important as that may be, God's self-revelation of God's wisdom, God's manifold wisdom, or the wisdom of God in its rich polychromatic variety, this mind-bogglingly complicated and varied wisdom comes through the church. Through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So God's revelation of God's self and God's own wisdom is the church, or at least comes through the church. The existence of a community of believers who have all sorts of varied backgrounds and diverse ethnicities and speak different languages and are different genders come together in the worship and obedience of Christ And this is God revealing God's self to the world. It is the church, not just the individual experience, but the church. But I wonder, is there any way for us to test this claim? Is this a testable hypothesis that's being advanced in the book of Ephesians? If the wisdom of God is being revealed through the church, would the world know it? Or is this describing a purely spiritual transaction that us mere mortals cannot be privy to, that God reveals this through the church and other spiritual beings see it, but we can't really recognize whether God has actually done anything dramatic in the world or not? Is it possible for us to see evidence of God's self-revelation through the church? What I want to suggest is that we do, in fact, see dramatic evidence in the years, decades, even centuries following the Christ event, as Christ comes into the world, forms a community around him, teaches them, dies for them and for the whole world, is raised by God from the dead, in the immediate aftermath of that, 
we begin to see something new emerge into the world through the church. Some have described it as a revolution in how people thought about and understood the world and their place in it and how they ought to relate with one another. Tom Holland, the historian, not the Spider-Man, uh, Tom Holland described what happened in the aftermath of the Christ event as being like depth charges placed under the fabric of everything the Roman world had taken for granted. And he goes on to say that we are still living in the reverberations of those depth charges to this day. There are things that make up the very fabric of how we understand ourselves and the universe and our place within it that are directly attributable to what happened in the immediate aftermath of Christ coming to earth, dying and being raised from the dead. David Bentley Hart, a theologian and philosopher, describes it this way. He says, as Christianity permeated and then absorbed the ancient civilization in which it was born, a new moral, spiritual, and intellectual atmosphere came into being. The rise of Christianity produced consequences so immense that it can almost be said to have begun the world anew. To have, quote, invented the human. To have bequeathed us our most basic concept of nature, to, determine, to have determined our vision of the cosmos and our place in it, and have shaped all of us, to one degree or another, in the deepest reaches of consciousness. Now this is an audacious claim to say that Christianity invented the very idea of a human being. This is an audacious claim. But what I wanna show is three ways that the movement of the early church reshaped the most basic assumptions about the world and the people within that world. And to see how so many of the things we take for granted that we call self-evident, are actually rooted in this very unusual tradition, this ancient alien thing that came into the world and blew things up, like depth charges placed underneath the fabric of everything people valued. And I wanna highlight these three, three things through the story of one family uh, who lived about 300, 350 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The first thing that the Christian movement does is it reintroduces or reframes the concept of the image of God. It was not a new idea for some human beings to claim that they were the likeness or image of God. It primarily happened among the ruling elite. You have a whole series of Roman emperors right around the time of Jesus who all claim to one degree or another to be somewhat divine. Caesar Augustus is described as the son of God whose birth brought peace to the world. And then a few decades after the death of Augustus, an emperor named Nero thought, found it very convenient for people to assume him to be not just, a, not just a, a general sense of a god, but a very specific god, the god Apollo. And so he would ride around in a chariot and allow people to presume that he was the earthly incarnation of Apollo. It was not uncommon for people to think about certain human beings as being divine or being the image of God on earth. But what Christian faith does that is so surprising is it takes the idea of the image of God and locates it most fully, in the language of Hebrews, calling Jesus the exact representation of God. It says that Jesus is the very image of God here on earth. But what separated Jesus from Caesar Augustus or Jesus from Nero is that they had power. They had status and standing. They had a legitimate claim to be closer to the gods than other human beings because they were at the pinnacle, the peak of the hierarchy of power and prestige and privilege in society. But what the early church claims is that the image of God is not to be found in the ruling elite, but the image of God is to be found in the likeness of a crucified criminal, a failed revolutionary, a member of the peasant class. Although Jesus was likely never formally enslaved, his legal status was the legal status of a slave. And what the early church asserts is that this this crucified man, humiliated for all to see, beaten down and executed by the might of Rome, this, not Caesar Augustus, not Nero, this Jesus, whom you crucified, 
is both Lord and Christ. He is God's anointed. He is the representation of God on this earth. He is the image of God. No one had ever made a claim that dramatic or audacious before in the history of the Western world. It was presumed that certain individuals were, in essence, people. They had rights, they had status, they had standing, and others were not. They were subhuman, they were less than human. They could be enslaved, they could be beaten, they could be raped, they could be executed with impunity. But the early church says no. In the faces of these teeming masses of lower class people, people not even presumed to have any right or status or standing, people not even presumed to be human, that is where you look to find the image of God. There was a bishop about 350 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. His name was Gregory, and he was bishop of a region called Nyssa. And Gregory, more profoundly than likely anyone who had come before him, began to speak and write about the image of God being present in the lower classes. And Tom Holland summarizes Gregory of Nyssa's thinking this way. He says, Nyssa believed that dignity, which no philosopher had ever taught might be possessed by the stinking, toiling masses, dignity was for all. There was no human existence so wretched, none so despised or vulnerable that it did not bear witness to the image of God. Divine love for the outcast and derelict demanded that mortals love them too. The idea of individual, personal, human dignity completely independent of the circumstances or situation in which you find yourself, completely independent of your socioeconomic privilege, completely independent of your ability to exercise power in the world. Dignity exists simply because you are a human being. And every human being is shaped, formed, fashioned in the likeness and image of God. And we take this for granted today. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The idea of equality among humans would have been anything except self-evident to the community in which the church was first formed. No one believed in these terms. No one spoke in this way. No one asserted individual, personal, human dignity except this ragtag group of followers of Jesus who saw in the image of a crucified man the very likeness and image of God. And as this idea continued to gain currency, continued to circulate, it birthed all of these other ideas that came from it. If every individual has dignity, then perhaps they have rights. Perhaps they are deserving of protection. Perhaps they have bodily autonomy. All of this begins to grow out of the church's assertion that every human being is made in the likeness and image of God. There is no human existence so wretched, none so despised or vulnerable, that it did not bear witness to the image of God. And what grows out of this, however subtly, is a radical critique of Roman understandings of power. Because in the Roman world, power was essentially absolute. It flowed in one direction only, from the powerful to the less powerful to the still less powerful to the powerless. And the only check against the assertion of power was someone more powerful than you. There was no reciprocity within power relationships. And so this manifests itself in all kinds of ways. You see it most clearly among the Caesars, the emperors. They had absolute power. No one called them into account. There had been attempts here and there among groups of powerful people to say, perhaps we can structure this a little bit differently. Perhaps we can structure our governance a little bit differently and give everyone a voice, everyone a say. But those fledgling attempts at democracy had been few and far between. They didn't tend to last very long. But what you had was a, uh, a solidification, a concentration of power among an absolute monarch who could do atrocious things without being called into question. It said that Nero would throw these wild parties outside his palace and to provide light, he would have Christians brought in and crucified and then lit on fire. 
as a pure exercise of power. There was no one more powerful than Nero, no one to call the emperor into account, but that power flowed down. And so those underneath Nero would exercise their power on those underneath them, who would exercise their power on those underneath them, and down and down and down and down and down it went. And so, and so you saw just widespread practices of sexual immorality, where the, the idea of consent was not even in the vocabulary, it was not even in the conceptualization. There was no such thing as consent. All that mattered was power. There was no check, no balance. Until the church begins to assert that every human being is made in the likeness and image of God, which means that to violate their bodily autonomy is to violate God. And the church begins to assert a belief that the God of all the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the idea of God they inherited from their Jewish ancestors and forerunners, that this God actually would hold earthly power to account. You see it in as early as uh, the book of Romans when Paul is writing maybe 30, 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul writes, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. This is not a new concept. Everyone had to be subject to the governing authorities. But then Paul makes this revolutionary statement, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Paul is dramatically relativizing the role of power, saying the power that you think you have, you only have because a higher power, God, has given this power to you. Gregory of Nyssa had a brother by the name of Basil who also became a bishop. Very fascinating family. And Basil became a bishop at a time when the Roman Empire was beginning to take notice of Christians. This is after the conversion of Constantine to Christianity. So emperors begin to take it upon themselves to meddle in the affairs and beliefs of the church. And the emperor at the time had some questions about what the, uh, what the bishop Basil was teaching. And so the emperor dispatched an emissary. And an emissary of an emperor is an awful lot of power because you are only accountable to the emperor, which means if the emperor has delegated power to you, you can wield power over anyone else and do essentially whatever you want. And so this emissary of the emperor comes to Basil and tries to get him to change his teachings. And Basil is not having it. He is just not having it at all. And this emissary of the emperor says to Basil, no one has ever spoken to me the way you speak to me. Essentially asserting, don't you know who I am? How dare you speak to me that way? I have the power of the emperor. How dare you? No one speaks to me that way. And do you know what Basil said to him? Basil said, perhaps you have never yet had to deal with a bishop. I mean, talk about chutzpah. Perhaps you have never yet had to deal with a bishop. Basil was not having it. The emperor himself could not wield power over Basil because Basil believed in a higher power, God. And it's interesting, the emperor tried to have Basil um, uh, exiled from his territory, from his region. And again, Basil just didn't go. He just refused to go. And eventually the emperor becomes so curious that he comes to visit one of the worship services Basil is presiding over in the church that Basil is bishop of. He comes for the Feast of the Theophany or the Feast of Epiphany. And he is so impressed by what he sees in this man Basil who has been so resistant to the emperor's power which the emperor believed to be absolute. He is so impressed by this emperor that he donates land to Basil's church. And Basil and his community take this land and use it to build what historians believe may have been the first hospital ever brought into existence. They are not just to care for the sick, but also to care for orphans, to provide education, to organize the distribution of food in the midst of a severe famine. Because the idea of power as being absolute becomes dramatically relativized by the Christian assertion of every human being being made in the likeness and image of God. So the early Christian church has this insight, this dramatic insight into human nature and sees within even the lowliest of human beings the essence and image of the divine. So it reshapes the way people think about individuals, human beings, bodily autonomy, individual rights, which also begins this cascade effect of calling into question power. How do we structure society and who is able to wield authority over whom and for what purposes? 
But the church also calls into question the Roman assumptions about glory. And what does it mean to actually possess glory? Glory in Roman society functioned almost like a currency. You could gain it, lose it, spend it, save it, earn it. It was like this tangible, almost concrete thing. The early church knew a thing or two about glory. But the things they knew about glory were different from what the Roman Empire knew about glory. There's a church historian by the name of Eusebius who was reflecting on the martyrdom of a woman named Blandina. And Eusebius says this, he says, those things reckoned by men low and invisible and contemptible are precisely what God ranks as deserving of great glory. This is flipping the value system of the world on its head, those things that are low and contemptible. These are the things that God sees as being of great glory. These brothers who were bishops, uh, uh, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil the Great, uh, they had other siblings as well. They actually had an older sister named Macrina. And it, it, it's not entirely sure, clear from their recollections who converted whom, but it seems likely that Macrina actually was the driving influence that led both Basil and Gregory into a life of service to the church. But Macrina had her own spiritual calling, her own way of being present in the world on behalf of Christ, of bearing the likeness and image of God and affirming the dignity of others because they too bared the likeness and image of God. And one of the ways Macrina would do this is she would seek after that which was low and contemptible and detestable. In particular, she would go and seek out infants who had been born to families that did not want them, possibly because the family was impoverished, perhaps because the infant was disfigured, or perhaps simply because the infant was female. And what families would do in this region in this day and age is they would take these infants and they would simply leave them out for the elements. Either they would die or they would be taken in, especially the girls taken in and raised to be prostitutes. And Macrina, on a regular basis, would go to the dump outside of the city and she would find infants who had been left to die. Low, detestable, contemptible. But Macrina would see in them the glory of God and Macrina would take these children into her own home and raise them. And Macrina believed this was what she was called to do as a follower of Jesus Christ. This Christian revolution has been so successful that we look at the example of Gregory, the example of Basil, the example of Macrina, and we just sort of take it for granted. We assume that of course you should not leave an infant out to die, to be exposed to the elements. Of course, you should not blindly follow those who have claimed to have power over you. You should be willing to assert your own personhood. Of course, everyone bears the likeness and image of God. We take these things for granted. But these are ideas, values, virtues that were birthed into the world through the church. You know, I'm highlighting these individual stories of this family, but all of this is communal effort. None of these individuals did this heroic work on their own. They were embedded in the context of a worshiping community, a church. And through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety was being revealed to rulers and authorities in heavenly places, but also to ordinary, everyday, common people, seeing that there is a new way to be human in the world. But it raises a question. If the impartation of these values, this revolution in thought that Christian faith birthed into the world, if it has been so successful, and all of us can take these values for granted now and assume them to be the way people have always thought about the world for all of time, if it has been so successful, does this thing that we're doing this morning matter anymore? Does it still matter that we come together as a community of faith to be continually reformed and refashioned in these values, in these virtues? Or should we take a page from Homer, sit at home on the couch, turn up the thermostat, watch the Three Stooges, and never ever go to church again? Because these values won. Right? We all take human dignity for granted now. We all know that power has limits, and we all know that glory is not to be found in uh, the pursuit of self-gratification, but in serving others. We know these things. These are common cultural values now, so does it matter anymore? 
Has the church already served its purpose? There's an argument to be made that that these values that I'm identifying as distinctly Christian are actually simply just good common sense. And that sooner or later, the world would have discovered that this is the best way to live our lives. These ideas would have outcompeted everyone else in a Darwinian sense. These were the fittest ideas, and so they would have survived. And sooner or later, this would have become the way everyone thought about the world. But I don't know that that's the case. It certainly from the historical record is not what actually happened to birth these ideas into the world. Nor do I believe we have any guarantee that these ideas will continue, that this way of life will continue. Because there's nothing about any of this, believing that every individual bears the likeness and image of God, believing that there are divine limits on the exercise of power, believing that glory is found in serving the least of these, nothing about that is natural. And we've seen examples of what happens when societies try to turn back the clock, to go back to values that existed before the advent of Christian faith. You see it most clearly in Nazi Germany. Although the Nazi party was remarkably effective at co-opting the church for its mission, it was clear that rulers of the Nazi party had no interest in genuinely Christian values. They were desiring to go back to a pre-Christian era, a time when Germans were Germans what they called pagan values. Heinrich Himmler had a 50-year plan for the eradication of the church. Once they had dispatched the Jews, they would turn their attention to the church because these values, these virtues that were being taught and practiced in the church were antithetical to the idea of a super German ruling society. But I don't know if we even have to go back that far in history to see what happens when we start to question some of these values, when we start to drift away from some of these revolutionary Christian impulses. We can probably recognize it in our own day and age. People who look at immigrants and refugees and don't see in them the image and likeness of God. People who seek for a ruler who could exercise unilateral power not constrained or hemmed in by any external force, but having absolute total power. There are some people in our society that are yearning for this. A sense of glory that's not connected to serving the least of these, but is connected to conquest and triumph and asserting oneself in the world. We can see In the news, in our own conversations, maybe in our own families, maybe even our own hearts and minds, we can see what happens if we lose sight of these revolutionary Christian values. Or instead of being continually brought back and refashioned into the example of Christ, we allow ourselves to be shaped and molded by other seemingly more natural values. I don't believe there's any guarantee that this revolution of thought and practice that Christianity brought into the world is guaranteed to exist forever. The only guarantee we have is the promise of Christ who said that I will build my church. This is how Jesus is bringing these values to bear again and again and again through the gathered church. As we come together for worship, and fellowship and service, we participate in the ongoing work of bringing these revolutionary, unnatural values into the world, a new way of being human. We are participating in this revolution. And I think actually we can see that. I know that as Mennonites we tend to be pretty humble. We don't like to brag about the good that we do in the world. But I wanna do a little experiment So I'm gonna call out some practices that are rooted in these sorts of values. And if you've ever done this, I want you to stand. And I want you to stay standing as we pray and uh, sing a response song together. So if you donated food that's in one of those boxes that's sitting out there that MCC is about to ship off to people in need, if you donated food to one of those boxes, would you stand? This is a profoundly unnatural act. Your food is your food. Why would you give it to someone else? If you have ever taken your time to go be involved in a service project in some other part of the country or other part of the world, through Mennonite Disaster Service or Mennonite Central Committee, would you stand? 
If you have ever given of your own finances to help someone in need, either directly or through the church, would you please stand? If you have ever looked into the well-being of someone who is not your blood relative to see if they're doing okay, to check in on them, would you please stand? This is the revolution of thought and practice that Jesus brought into the world. And all of us are participating in this work on an ongoing basis, being formed and fashioned into the likeness and image of Christ. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for the example of Jesus that birthed an entirely new way to be human in the world. We stand in awe at the success of the revolution that Jesus started without weapons, without formal power, but simply by the power of his example and the example of his early followers. And we give you thanks that we are continuing to participate in this ongoing revolution, celebrating a new way to be human in the world. We give you thanks for this in the name of Christ. Amen.